Well, I know we were in the 50s, pushing into the 60s last week, and we've moved into the territory of, at one level, what's current events. I mean, things that happened 50 years ago, there has not been enough time for any kind of major reflection at all. So we're going to be hitting a number of things over uh, this week, next week, in the last class on the 20th, we're going to be hitting a number of things sort of by title, in large part because there just isn't enough background and lapsed time for reflection. I think when we ended last week, I was talking about the fact that a group called Associated Parishes in the mid to late 1950s um, put out a pamphlet in favor of making the Eucharist, the principal service on Sunday morning. And that as the principal service, the ministers should face the people. And that because that would encourage the corporate participation of the congregation in the right. Now, as background, up until 1970s, the standard position in 98% of Episcopal Church, the standard position for celebrating the Eucharist was that the priest would face the altar like I, our high altar and the whole Eucharist would be celebrated with the priest's back to the congregation. So we wouldn't be able to hear a thing. Well, no, uh, two things. They would be amplified if need be. And some of you may recall that with the old sound system, maybe you didn't even pay attention, up at the high altar, coming down from the roof was a microphone. And that microphone was there with the old sound system to amplify the presider. So how old was the old sound system? When was it put in? Around 82, okay. 83, something like that. Now, here's the other thing, though. When they did the renovation of the organ in 2009, there were mics up there to record the choir, and there was the mic for the priest at the high altar. When they did the renovation in 2009, something that they did up in the attic, there is a space above the choir stalls, something that they did in the attic cut the mics for recording the choir and cut the mic for picking up the priest at the high altar, which mandated the use of hand, you know, a handheld lavalier kind of thing. Speaking of that, could you check where your microphone is? Yeah, it's way over here in my elbow. Let's do something totally different. Sorry for all the rumbling that anybody is hearing, especially Janet Tapley. You did? Yes. Oh, how nice. She may or may not be here today. Cool. Anyway, uh, so that mandated the use of lavalier mics here at Christ Church. Once they were cut, there was no way to amplify from the high altar. In the old days, before sound systems, it simply meant that the priest had to project a talent that many clergy in the 20th century lost because they, it, it wasn't really how to project, how to speak slowly so that your words can be heard in the back without them being jumbled. Anyway. Well, we lost a priest to that. So Father Hale had polyps on his throat, uh, and he couldn't project anymore, and yep. so he had to go to a small church where he didn't yep. do that. Yep. Small church, it works. Big yeah. church like this. It's problematic. So late 50s, Associated Parishes is saying that the clergy need to turn around, the altars need to be pulled out, and we all need to be facing each other at the celebration of the Eucharist. Because it not only would increase congregational participation, but it would be a more symbolic celebration of the banquet, the festal banquet that we will all be part of after we die. And here it would be made present on earth in a way that 
facing the wall didn't accomplish that. So in order to do this, they would have to redesign buildings. Now some parishes gave it a hearty try at trying to pull the high altar away from the wall. Well, aside from the fact that if it's uh, stone like ours, it's not only too big, but it's totally impractical. Aside from that, uh, even if it was wood, and you could figure out how to get it off of the east wall, there oftentimes then was only about 15 inches of space between the wall and the edge of the altar because the platform, you couldn't put it on the edge of the platform. You had to have it back from the edge of that step. So this became part of an uproar that moved into the 60s and 70s against the freestanding altar, which those of you who've been around here at Christ Church for a while know that that continued here into the 80s and 90s, okay? Anyway, Associated Parishes, which was made up of a large number of parishes, made suggestions. Most of these would not appear until the 1979 prayer book was enacted. They, they pushed for changes in the late 50s, and it would be 20 years before this would actually happen. Among the changes that they wanted to do was they wanted to move the breaking of the bread from the middle of the Eucharistic prayer to after the Lord's Prayer. Now, unless you remember really clearly the 28 prayer book, in the 28 prayer book, you would have the offertory. Then you would say the prayers of the people. Then you would begin the Eucharistic prayer. And in the middle of that prayer, when the bread is consecrated, there would be the big symbolic breaking of the bread. And then you would go on and consecrate the wine and yada yada. Well, one of the changes that Associated Parishes was pushing was that the breaking of the bread needed to be something that was symbolic and vis visible. And so what would often happen is you'd have a priest facing a high altar come to the breaking of the bread, and that you might see the elbows give a little move, but you never saw the breaking of the bread in the middle of the Eucharistic prayer. And that got moved in the 79 prayer book. Okay? Um, they wanted to reintroduce a verbal exchange of the peace. That had been absent from Anglican prayer books since 1552. So, back in the day, back in the 70s, when this was really being pushed out in terms of trial use, oh, we don't do that. Oh, I'm, no, this interrupts the service. We don't do things like that. Well, guess what? Cranmer put it in, and it was in until 1552, and the 1552 prayer book, as I've told you many times, was a Protestant revision of what Cranmer did in 1549. The Protestant reformers wanted to see many changes from what Cranmer had done. One of those changes was out went the passing of the peace. Um, and the last thing that they w were proposing in the late 50s that would not come in until the 79 prayer book is they wanted to move the Gloria from the end of the service to the beginning of the service. Again, unless you can remember the 28 prayer book, and let's face it, the 28 prayer book went out 40 years ago, okay? But in the 28 prayer book, the Gloria was sung after you received communion. It was not considered a song of praise at the beginning, it was a song of praise at the end. But that was never its historic place. And the Gloria at the beginning of the Eucharist is where Cranmer had it in 1549. And I don't remember for sure, but I think it was in 1559 that it got moved to the end, and that's where it remained 
until the 79 prayer book. Now, we look at these changes today, 40 years into the 79 prayer book, and, and we think, wow, who could be upset about any of that stuff? <laughs> well, these were proposed, but nobody saw any of this in the late 50s because the House of Bishops forbid it. The House of Bishops said that such changes could only be used for special occasions, but not for regular public worship. So it would be 20 years before these things that we consider normal today would actually come into the life of the average Episcopalian. Now, uh, among the other things that got in the way of liturgical change is we, we get to the 60s. Uh, well, you know, pesky women, pesky blacks, pesky anti-war demonstrators. I mean, we had a lot of peskiness in the 60s. Um, backing up for a minute, the, you all know that uh, on January 1st, 1948, by fiat, by executive order, uh, Harry Truman desegregated all branches of the military. Okay? Um, you know that in 1954, the Supreme Court heard Brown versus Board of Ed and uh, pushed aside uh, Plessy Ferguson from 1896. So separate but equal would no longer be the norm. By the uh, early part of the 60s, among the changes that emerged from World War II was the fact that there were now more blacks in industry. Um, black soldiers who had served, obviously, in segregated units during World War II had come back and with greater experience and entered the marketplace. With the desegregation in 48, once we went into Korea, units were, seg were, excuse me, were integrated, not segregated, okay? So what we began to see, late 50s, early 60s, is there was white flight from within the urban areas out to the suburbs. And um, suddenly, by the 60s, Areas of the country, like the North, the Mid-Atlantic, and the West, began to, people in those areas began to live in as segregated a neighborhood as they would have in the South. The Episcopal Church slowly began the process of addressing issues of segregation, integration, etc. You may remember we talked about the Sewanee Canon, we talked about the convocation system that existed in many southern dioceses, you know, where blacks convocated and they got X number of delegates to diocesan convention, but not the same as each parish, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. General Convention never adopted any kind of a national segregation, integration kind of policy. Um, with the exception of General Convention in 1889 and 1892, no diocese sent black deputies to General Convention until after World War II. That was also the time when we began to get rid of that old convocation system that it still existed in some dioceses, but it was still a time when you could have within cities a black parish on this block and a white parish on that block, and because all the whites came from this angle and because all the blacks came from that angle and because housing practices had become even more segregated, those two churches could be a block apart and have almost no interaction with each other. Hmm? There were still parish boundaries. Then too. Well, there, there were, but they were, post-World War II is 
when parish boundaries began to break down. Some of you may be saying, what's that? Well, uh, historically, a parish was a geographical area. And, you know, Rome still tries to adhere to this, even though it's broken down in, since Vatican II. But, for example, uh, this is not a good... All right, uh, my parish in New York was on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. It was at 72nd and Madison Avenue. St. Bartholomew's was at 51st and Park. Park was two blocks east of Madison Avenue, and obviously it was 21 blocks south of St. James. Technically, the parish of St. James was the Upper East Side of New York going up to 86th Street because there was another Episcopal church north of 86th Street. But technically, it would not have gone below 72nd because St. Bart's would have had that area. But the fluidity of life after World War II is when you began to see, slowly but surely, the concept of a parish being a geographical area with a church in the middle of it. You began to see that break down. Not as obvious in a place like England, where you still can have a parish church in a village, and then that village over there has a different parish church. I know up here in the Northeast, most of the states have counties, but you know down in the South, a lot of what we would deem counties are called parishes. Only, only Louisiana. Only Louisiana? Yeah. Okay. And, and that's uh, left over from their French heritage. Okay. Um, but their parish is technically the same as a county. Has okay. nothing to do nothing to do with a church. But, yep, yep. Um, so anyway, throughout the 50s, things began to change in the Episcopal Church slowly but surely with regard to uh, its black members. In 1951, a man named John Walker, a black man, was sent by his white Bishop of Michigan, Richard Emmerich, to be a student at Virginia Theological Seminary, 1951. He was the first black student at Virginia. He, I'm not positive about this, but I think he may have been the first black student in one of the main Episcopal seminaries that was not historically black. Bishop Payne Seminary was started in the 1870s, 1880s, I think, um, as a black seminary at one of the historically black colleges. But blacks going to General or EDS or Virginia hadn't been heard of. Christine. This would be a silly question, but did the black college versus the white college teach theology, theology differently based on uh, yes. Yeah. Um, I think it was a couple of weeks ago I was talking about, briefly, about how before World War II there was a, an attempt to make the Episcopal seminary, seminaries more of an academic institution, moving away from the reading for orders and into um, Accreditation from the uh, uh, accreditation organizations. So it really did depend on who you are, you are uh, under learning from. Right. The black seminaries, uh, as I understand it, well, the, not seminaries. There was only one black seminary, and that was Bishop Payne. And it tended to be more reading for orders than an ac uh, a, 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 this is so pejorative, a solid academic program. That's not meant to put down everybody who graduated from Bishop Payne, but post-World War II, we we're in a whole different light, and there was the desire to ensure that black clergy were on the same playing field as their white brothers. And so John Walker went to Virginia. He would go on to become the Bishop of Washington, D.C. So this was the beginning of big changes in the Episcopal Church. Uh, we established after World War II a new seminary in Austin, Texas. Um, 
the Episcopal Seminary of the Southwest. And in 1951, their faculty adopted a policy that said that nobody would be denied entrance on the basis of their race. And indeed, they went proactive looking for uh, black candidates to come to Austin. Uh, Bishop Payne, which had always struggled, I mean, that, that's been true of all of the black colleges and all, they, they're, they've never had as large a student body as some of their white uh, Episcopal sister colleges. And Bishop Payne was just, was among that. And in 1953, they merged with Virginia. In 1953, Sewanee, and if you think back to the Civil War, you'll remember that we talked about Leonidas Polk, who was the Bishop of Louisiana and a graduate of West Point, whom Jeff Davis uh, appointed him to be a Lieutenant General in the Rebel Army, and his ability to lead troops into battle was minimal. He also was a founder of Sewanee, of the University of the South. And so you can just imagine being supported by all the southern dioceses. You can just imagine how many blacks were enrolled at Sewanee by the 50s. Yeah, just, just what Don said. In 1953, they refused to change, to take the same kind of pro-integration stance that Austin did. And so six faculty members upped and resigned. 35 students walked out, interrupted their education to make a point, and transferred from Swanee to one of the other Episcopal seminaries. This forced Swanee to have to go back to the drawing board and decide, the board of trustees, and decide what they really wanted to do. Is, was this the face in the mid-50s that they wanted to put forward? And so in 1954, Sewanee admitted the first black student to the undergraduate program and the first black seminarian. 1955, general convention was scheduled to be in Houston. <coughs> well, I don't know how much you know about general convention, but by the 50s, it was fast becoming the behemoth that it is today. In the 50s, it was two weeks, okay, 14 days. Every diocese had four clergy deputies and four lay deputies, and whatever number of bishops they had. The national church had all of its staff there. So any city that got general convention after World War II was happy as a clam. Right now, um, general convention is larger than either the Democratic or the Republican National Convention because it goes on for so long and all of those people are there for the whole time. Think about it. The Republican and the Democratic Convention, they're there for the platform about four days ahead of time and then the public work of the convention is about four days and they're gone. General Convention, even today, is 10 days long. And if you think about it, four deputies, four lay, four clerical deputies for, what do we have? 107 dioceses times eight. So that puts you up close to what? 900 deputies. Then there are about 350 bishops, but they don't all come. So you probably got 200 to 250 bishops that come. So now we're over 1,000 people, and we have not included the staff from 815, nor have we included the vendors who come to sell you everything. People love having us. Do they know what 815 means? Oh, good, thank you. 815 is the address of the national headquarters for the Episcopal Church, and it's 815 Second Avenue in New York, which is where they've been since the early 60s. Anyway. Houston suddenly woke up to the fact that the Episcopal Church was coming, and that meant that blacks were coming. And hotels objected to having to provide rooms for blacks. The restaurants objected to having 
to let black deputies come in through the front door. And so, the Episcopal Church said, fine, have it your way. And they moved the convention on less than six months' notice. They moved the convention from Houston to Honolulu. Now, can you imagine what that cost every diocese? Oh, that was probably way more expensive. Uh, way more expensive. Anyway, so in the 60s, we come in to this wonderful time period. Uh, We talked about those rabble-rousing Vietnam opposers, and we talked about those rabble-rousing women and those rabble-rousing blacks. Well, we also had rabble-rousing lay readers in the Episcopal Church. Yeah. <laughs> um, up until General Convention 1961, a lay, we had lay readers, but they could only serve in the liturgy in the absence of a priest. So in other words, you could not, for example, have a lay reader reading a lesson. You couldn't have a lay reader assisting with a chalice. You couldn't have a lay reader leading any kind of worship if there was a priest in the parish. If there wasn't a priest, then they could step forward and do all these things. Well, General Convention in 1961 revised the canons to encourage the ongoing active use of lay readers as assistants at the service, even if a priest was present. Now, some of you may have heard back in the day, uh, especially those of you who are lay readers, you may have heard that, well, you can only read a lesson if there isn't a priest available, or you can only lead the prayers of the people if there isn't a priest available. Well, 1961 was trying to correct that, that any lay person could read the prayers, could read a lesson, even if you had 16 priests sitting around, okay? By 1967, General Convention continued to expand the role of the lay reader. That was when they authorized lay people to assist with the chalice. 67, they also said that the laity could have input in the selection of their clergy. Previously, the wardens would sit down with the bishop and the bishop would say, well, here's a list of names. And Suppose you were a parish that didn't agree with your bishop, and this became really important in the 60s, when you had bishops that were protesting in front of the Pentagon, and when you had bishops that were marching in Selma and various other places in the South, when you had bishops that were encouraging the burning of bras, all of a sudden, if, you, if your parish was looking for a new priest, and you didn't agree with the politics of your bishop, you might not be happy with the list of possibilities. So General Convention, in the midst of all this, gave the laity new input, setting up search committees, being that vehicle. They also gave laity more input in 1970 because laity could now serve on the Commission on Ministry. Back in those days, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Not only. 1970 is when we were first. That's exactly where we're going. In 1971, no, 1970, 1970, women. Remember, I told you about Mrs. Randolph Dyer last week from Missouri? She was really early in the 1946, she got in because nobody knew what to do. 1949, when she came back, they all had their ducks in a row and said the word men only refers to the male species, and she was not seated as a deputy. Well, it was 1970 when General Convention would authorize women deputies and women to serve on vestries. Up until now, 
Up until then, every vestry was all male. Every deputation to general convention was all male. All the clergy people were all male. We are coming into the real rabble-rousing time, okay? In addition to those issues of rabble-rousing, in 1968, at the Lambeth Conference, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury encouraged his fellow bishops to recognize baptism as the right of initiation into the church. Up until that point, the rubrics in the prayer books said that the reception of Holy Communion was limited to those who were confirmed. With the 1968 Lambeth meeting, the bishops were now saying, baptism gives you full membership. Confirmation is merely the public acknowledgement of the promises that your parents made for you as a baby. Um, the life in the Episcopal Church was a little slow on the uptake on that one. Um, we did authorize in 1969 communion for unconfirmed children. But if you can remember life in the Episcopal Church in the 70s, you could go to that parish and there's the priest busy handing out wafers to any child who comes up. Next week you could go to that parish and the kid would be here like this and the priest literally would just walk right by him because they did not believe that you could receive communion until you were confirmed. You had to understand what you were doing. Do you have any idea how many times a priest hears this kind of language, not only from clergy back in those days, but heard it from laity? Well, how can you give communion to, to Zephira or Reese or Tessa? They don't know what they're doing. How do you know that? Well, not only that, but you know, we live in an age where we take communion to people who are suffering from dementia and uh, Alzheimer's. Um, people who are uh, in ICU and intubated or semi, um, obviously if you're intubated, we can't give them communion, but you know, who are semi um, <laughs> on top of it. Yeah. And one can ask the same question of them. Do, Sometimes people who want to kill <laughs> No kidding. <laughs> when, when I was at St. James, uh, um, as a layperson, I was a chalice bearer. And the clergy and I would laugh on Christmas Eve because at the 11 o'clock service on Christmas Eve, they came in in their tuxes and they came in in their, their gowns and their cocktail dresses and we knew where they had been. They had either been to the family gathering or they'd been to the club and they had had one too many scotches, not to mention the wine with dinner, not to mention the martinis. And we'd watch them coming up to receive communion. Now, I'm sure you have. I'm sure you have. So what I, all I'm leading up to is back in the day, we don't hear it as much today, but back in the day you used to hear, well, Children don't know unless they've been taught. What was that song, they have to be carefully taught? Yeah, right, as if they haven't figured it out just by being there with the rest of us. Well, I know it was, but you know, we can exhibit all kinds of prejudice at times, right? So, what we found, I need something to lean on. <laughs> what we found from the <laughs> mid 60s to the mid 70s were some, serious changes happening in the fabric of the Episcopal Church. Uh, women are on vestries, 
women can be deputies and slowly but surely women a woman's role in the ordination situation began to change. In 1964, we had to begin slowly, so we had to test the water with a toe, okay? So in 1964, General Convention said that deaconesses had the same right to marry as male deacons. Up until now, if you chose to be a deaconess in the Episcopal Church, you could not marry, which is why so many people thought deaconesses were nuns. They could marry a spouse and remain a deaconess of the church. Uh, in 65, you know, let me back up and say, you've got to love the Episcopal Church because when we think maybe we ought to be considering some big change, we appoint a committee. Yeah. And we're going to study this. So, in 65, they appointed a commission to study the proper place of women in ministry. They reported a year later, and the report suggested that bishops should consider ordaining women to the priesthood and the episcopacy. What's the episcopacy? That's the level of bishops. Okay. Okay? Um, like, like, like I mentioned, General Convention allowed women to become lay readers and to become deputies. And by the late 60s, we had two schools for women to study to be a deaconess. One was in Philadelphia, one was in New York. By the late 60s, both of those schools were closed as more and more women who wanted to consider being a deaconess, were attracted to go to seminary to study with the men as opposed to going off to one of the schools of deaconesses. Oh, so they go, they're going to separate them out? That just doesn't make any sense. Oh. Well, you know, it's, it, it's pretty tough, I think, in 2018 to imagine this, but this was a norm. Right. I mean, th think about it for a minute. Even if you weren't alive 50 years ago, think about it for a minute. We still had separate men's colleges and women's colleges. Radcliffe College was a separate entity from Harvard until the 70s. Um, Pembroke College in Providence was separate from Brown. Uh, you know, we talk about the Little Sisters, Wellesley, Smith, Vassar. They were all women's colleges until the 70s. Even colleges that were not had separate women's quarters and... Oh yeah, there was no such thing as a co-ed dorm back in these days. Uh-uh. And... It was, starting, it was just starting when, when I was of college age. Mm-hmm. That was a long time ago. <laughs> and then, you know, in the, Epis in the life of the Episcopal Church, you need to back it up even more because the prep schools were gender specific. St. Paul's School up in Concord, which is undergoing tremendous problems with regard to the uh, activities of former faculty members, it was all boys until the late 70s, maybe even the early 80s, when they first admitted women. I just realized that I was, I was one of the first Eucharistic ministers and lay readers in the Episcopal Church, and I didn't even realize it. Was in the, it was in the 70s. Yeah, you would have been. Yeah, 19, I, I became Episcopalian in 1977. And it was just a couple of years after that that I became a Eucharistic minister and a lay reader. When it, it was in 19, I think I told you the story about me pouring the water down the, the front of my rector's shirt when I was training. No, I guess I didn't. Well, anyway. <laughs> The, 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 the point of me bringing this up is, it was 1979, after the second reading of the 79 prayer book, which made it official that St. James, who had had a handful, and when I say a handful, I want to say three 
maybe for lay readers. Okay? And all of a sudden, because of the new prayer book and because it was all part of the practice, because we didn't have to have a priest doing everything at the Eucharist, we could have lay people with the clergy. All of a sudden, when I was being trained, there were 14 or 15 of us who were being brought on board, and that was 78 or 79. And the, the joke is that at St. James, on, uh, uh, on Christmas Eve, it was the uh, tuxes and the gowns. Easter morning, it was the big hats. And <laughs> so we were being trained, and the rector thought it would be really funny. He had a big uh, fedora that he he loved hats, but he had a big fedora with a larger brim than one thinks. Okay, so anyway, he's there, he's got on a black clergy shirt, okay, and he's got this hat on. And so, of course, the hat is coming out like this, and he's kneeling. And so I'm coming along, and mercifully, there was no wine in the chalice, it was water, and I'm trying to see, and he's doing what people do with hats, which is, Yes. Actually, people do this without hats. Yes. They, so, when you're using, bearing a chalice, and somebody's like this, and, and it's, it, you know, they think like they're going to ruin some time with God, and so you're, you're there snaking around. Well, if they have a hat on, you are really snaking around because you can't figure out where their lips are. All right? And so I'm trying to find his lips, and I think I'm there, but I'm not really looking because I'm not doing this. And so I start doing this. And the next thing I see is... <laughs> <laughs> needless to say, it served him right, but needless to say, I never, ever have done a chalice again with a hat without just getting down there and seeing what's going on. Don't any of you put on any hats anytime soon. I'll shoot every one of you. <laughs> It's funny, I usually wear a hat. We had, a, we had an associate priest whose wife wore a big hat. Oh. But, but she was cool as a cucumber, and what we would do would be lift it up and find it up. And then she got us. But the other thing is, the Christmas drunks, if you miss their mouth, they yell at you right out loud. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. It's all your fault. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so. 1970, the church authorized women, general convention, I mean, authorized women to be ordained as deacons. As opposed to deaconesses. Right. In other words, they agreed that women could become deacons. So what's the difference okay. between a deaconess and a deacon? A deaconess... Uh, is someone whose role was to serve the community, whether it was as a teacher, as a nurse, as a social worker, although back in, you know, we didn't use that kind of language back in the 1800s, but that was her role. If she chose that path, as I mentioned a minute ago, up until 1964, she could not be married, okay? She also was never considered the reverend. And so therefore, she was often called sister. Now, if you have any experience with uh, Baptist churches of any color in the South, or if you have experience with black congregations anywhere in the country, they have a board of deacons, and that board of deacons is there to care for and ensure pastoral care to members of the congregation. And they are often, regularly, almost all, referred to as Sister Dixie, Sister Kay. And because in those Protestant denominations, they also would have Men, the men would often be called Brother Don, Brother Tom, okay? So that's a deaconess. A deacon 
back way back in the early church, you know, back to three four hundred. Deacon was an order within the church. So you were ordained a deacon to serve the community. And that would be what you would do. You would be called the reverend. Slowly, that evolved into deacon being the first level of ordination before you became a priest. That model lasted until, again, 70s, maybe, at least in the Episcopal and Anglican Church. Um, that, let me back up and, and say, in Anglo-Catholic parishes, they may have had a deacon who was not going to be made a priest between the advent of the Oxford movement and, the, and 1970. But in general, when you're ordained, the first ordination is as a deacon, and you're supposed to spend six months to a year learning the ropes and getting used to being ordained. And at the end of that time, then you were ordained a priest. What General Convention did was they said that the women could be ordained as deacons with absolutely no clear path to, pri to priesthood at that point in time. Well, in, in some ways it was. Uh, Probation, basically. Yeah, you know, there, 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 were, there were a number of ways to look at it. Usually, you were a deacon for six months because the bishop needed you somewhere as a priest. I was a deacon for a year because I was still working, I was doing an advanced degree, okay. and I wasn't in a parish. That was the other thing. You had to be in a parish before you could go on to priesthood. So, uh, most people who were ordained a deacon were deacon for six months. And they hated every bit of it. If you talk to people who were ordained a deacon 60s, 70s, 80s, oh, God, I'm going to be ordained a priest on December 18th! Yeah! <laughs> well, they're jokingly called the ABCs. When you are a deacon, you cannot absolve someone of their sins. You cannot uh, bless the congregation at the end of the service. And you can't consecrate the elements. And so in seminary, it's jokingly called the ABCs. You can't do the ABCs. Okay? And... It's just one of these things you're, you believe you're called to be a priest. And so, for many people, it's like six months of purgatory. God, will this ever end? <laughs> then you get people like Ben. But don't they have deacons that are longer now? Yes, and I'm going to come to that in a minute after I tell you a funny story about Ben. So, Ben's bishop, Ben was sponsored by the Diocese of Ohio, which is northern Ohio, and his bishop had a rule that you had to be a deacon for a year. And Ben didn't have any problem with that. But he was called to St. Paul's Church in Selma, Alabama. Well, that meant that he wasn't working in the Diocese of Ohio, even though he still reported to the Bishop of Ohio. He was now working in Alabama, and that was a totally different bishop. Okay, so the bishop at the time was a man named... Uh, Furman Stow, and he was called Bill by everybody except the brand new deacons like Ben. Anyway, uh, at some point after, oh, I know what it was. Ben got there, and the guy who hired him, he got there in July, and the guy who hired him resigned on August the 1st and went off to another church, leaving Ben by himself. He was not only by himself, but he was a deacon. So what couldn't he do? ABCs, communion. So this meant that in order to celebrate the Eucharist, he couldn't celebrate. So somebody would come in and the reserve and create, you know, a store of reserve sacrament so that Ben could hand out communion. Okay. So at some point in a conversation with Bill Stow, 
Stiles said, Ben, we're, we're going to have you ordained a priest by Christmas. And if you're not ordained by Christmas, I'll come down and do Christmas Eve service here at St. Paul's in Selma. And Ben said, I, this is beyond my pay grade, Bishop. You're going to have to go talk to Jim Moody because he's made it clear I have to be a deacon for a year. Yeah, well, you just don't worry about that. I'll take care of that. <laughs> so, Ben's not sure what the conversation was like. All he knows is that Bill Stout called him and said, Now, Ben, what time are those services on Christmas Eve? Because I'm going to be there. <laughs> Jim Moody said, No, I will not allow him to be ordained less than six months. His ordination had been June 28th. Six months was December 28th, three days after Christmas. And so, he said, after his six months, I will transfer him to you, and then you are free to set the date of his ordination. So, he was transferred to Bill Stow. Let's say it was December 29th. He was transferred to Bill Stow, and Ben was ordained to the priesthood on January 12th. But Bill Stow was there on Christmas Eve. Now, your point about deacons, today in the life of the church, we have two types of deacons. We have what are called transitional deacons. And so Ben and I had been, you can come right on in and do whatever you have to do. Don't worry, I'm almost done. It's 10 o'clock. So transitional deacons are those who are intending to go on to priesthood. But we have resurrected that old order that I mentioned a little while ago, which is now called permanent deacon. And it's called permanent, de or vocational deacon is the other phrase that we use. And the reason it's called that is to try to identify those people apart from the rest of us who were deacons on our way to something else. It's an attempt to honor those who believe that their vocation is in this world and in the church. So a, a vocational or a permanent deacon is somebody who were, ha, has a job somewhere out there. And it can be all kinds of jobs. Okay? And what they do is they also are in a parish where they are able to read the gospel, perhaps lead the prayers if there isn't a lay person around, um, administer a chalice along with a lay person. The point being that they are taking a model of ministry from the world into the church and from the church back into the world. And so anyway, next week we'll get into Vietnam War and other fun, funky things.